Okay. So, um, welcome to the latest inspirational speaker talk. We are the, the School of European Culture and Languages at the University of Kent, and this talk is organised as part of the Student Success Project. Today's speaker is Kendra Calhoun from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Kendra works on sociocultural linguistics, so she combines sociolinguistic methods with media studies, black studies and feminist studies. Among other things, she compares institutional rhetoric around diversity with the lived experiences of students of colour, which is a topic that's extremely relevant at present when universities and other institutions are scrambling to put out statements on diversity. In her research, she also focuses on the linguistic and cultural practice of black social media users and particularly racial humour and digital activism, which is what she's going to speak about to us today. So welcome, Kendra. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for being here. Um, so I'll share my screen and my slides in a second. Um, just wanted to give a heads up. So I do have some videos that I'll be playing and I know they might lag a little bit with the internet connection. So I have some basic transcripts for those. Um, but if there's any problem with the audio or anything, just kind of say verbally that you can't hear because I'm not gonna try and keep up um, with the chat. So just want to let everyone know that ahead of time. All right, so as Laura said, I'll be talking about analyzing race, humor, and activism online through the lens of Black digital culture. So my talk today is gonna to be basically an overview of some of the phenomena that I'm interested in and some of the um, data that I've looked at. Um, and so I'm taking a sort of case study approach um, through um, before I dive that are going to come up throughout the talk, make sure we're all on the same page, um, give a little bit of the context for the research that I'm doing, both in terms of like theoretical, historical and cultural context. Um, so like research wise and socially wise, like why this research um, is important and how it's come to be. Um, I'll do two sort of case studies, one on Vine and one on Tumblr, and then I'll talk about some conclusions as far as, again, um, why this research is important. So some key terms for this talk and this kind of area of research would be social media, activism, and discourse, which lots of people use these terms all the time, but not everyone uses them in the same way. Um, as far as social media, I use that as an umbrella term to talk about um, media that affords user-generated content, which just means that the people who are on the platform are actually producing the content that people engage with. So most major um, what people think of as social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, right? It's the people on there who are producing the, the photos, the videos, all of that sort of stuff that we're engaging with. And then the other major factor is this, what puts the social in social media. And so that's users being able to engage with each other, right? So we can post something and then other people can like it, repost it, comment on it, and we can have a sort of dialogue and back and forth. Um, so in some way kind of showing that you're engaging with someone else. As far as activism, um, again, a term that different people will define differently. I think of it as um, resistance of hegemonic power, ideologies, and practices, and efforts toward equity and justice through interpersonal and institutional change. So this sort of, it's a kind of broad way of thinking about activism, but that's part of what I'm interested in my research is sort of uh, maybe not pushing back against, but expanding the ways that we think about um, what counts as activist discourse or action. And then as far as discourse, um, from both the structure and function perspective, um, it's language beyond the sentence, but also all that that entails. So we can look at individual words and phrases and sentences and think about that within like the larger bodies of language that they're part of. So that could be part of an essay, part of a speech, part of a textbook, right? So it's not just kind of those individual bits of language, but everything else um, kind of beyond that. And then as far as um, the medium, I look at text, obviously, um, but also embodiment. Um, so things like facial expression, gesture, how that all ties together. And then in an online context, I'm also interested in visual discourse. So images, GIFs, memes, all of that, for me, it counts as discourse. And then as far as function, 
um, discourse is language and use. So we're using language as some sort of action, some sort of social behavior. So we can think about, you know, what are the individual morphemes or phonemes or clauses, but when thinking about discourse, we're also interested in, like, what was that person trying to accomplish by using a particular linguistic structure? Um, who are they talking to? What's the larger context that they're speaking or, or writing or signing in? So thinking both about the structure and the function of language. And so I make a point of doing that because particularly in online context, the term discourse is used a lot to refer um, specifically to like argument or debate, which is a type of discourse, um, but just wanted to be clear that we're thinking um, beyond just that sort of genre of communication. This is just kind of a little map of what we'll be talking about. So first thinking about sort of the context for this research. Um, so I'm going to talk about the idea of technological affordances. Um, affordances is a term people may have heard. Um, it's kind of been a, a buzzword for a while now. Um, then thinking about platform specificity when talking about social media. And then this convergence of technology and black cultural practices that's really important and makes my own research possible. As far as technological affordances, excuse me, um, this is basically what you can do or what you're restricted from doing based on the design of the technology that you're using. Oftentimes when people talk about affordances, they focus on just what you are able to do. Um, but when we think about um, the affordances as a concept, what we aren't able to do or what we're restricted from doing is also important. Um, so Ian, Ian Hutchby has theorized this idea of affordances. Um, and in his work, he gives the example of the telephone. So he talks about technological artifacts, like physical objects or things that we can use. So he's talking about telephone, old school, like plugged into a wall. All you can do is hear someone talk into it, kind of telephone. And so he talks about how this is something that affords intimacy at a distance. And that comes through the feature or the capability of the phone to transmit sound and for us to hear sound. And in doing so, we can kind of maintain our relationships with whoever that person is that's physically distant. Right, so the affordance isn't necessarily the same thing as the feature, um, but oftentimes they're talked about very similarly. And just to give a couple other examples, so we can think about Zoom as an artifact. Now it's more like a software or a digital artifact as opposed to something physical, um, but that affords synchronous teaching or uh, research talks where people can attend from all over the world. And that's because Zoom has the features of being based on the internet, you can share screens, you can use a microphone. So all of those different features allow us to do different things with that technology. Um, and Twitter as another example, has the feature of being able to retweet or repost um, people's content. And what that leads to is this widespread circulation of public content if people really like it and it becomes really popular. So that's um, kind of a key idea that's gonna come up again and again is this idea of affordances and what that allows us to do or not do on certain platforms. So getting to this idea of platform specificity, um, technological affordances are important here because the different affordances that platforms have um, then lead to specific types of um, what discourse looks like, the ways that people interact with each other, and the kind of network and community structure that's in that space. So if we think about, um, what we can produce, like the type of discourse we can produce. So thinking, you know, way back when, when Twitter had uh, whatever it was 140, 160 character limit, right? The way, the type of discourse that people produced looked different because you're trying to compress more into less space. Um, and then if we also think about something like being able to post a thread on Twitter, um, that's something you can do pretty easily as opposed to like on Instagram and the comments, you can't really do that. Um, so the way that these platforms are structured is really important as far as the way that people produce discourse and interact with each other. Um, and Gretchen McCulloch's book, um, Because Internet has a good discussion of this, thinking about like the time at which certain platforms um, emerge, whether they're text-based, can you use emojis or GIFs, how that shapes how we interact with each other. And then as far as community and network structures, um, different aspects like anonymity, whether or not you have to have like a full profile like you do on Facebook, or you know, back in the day for people who are old enough to remember MySpace, right? You have like both your um, uh, profile like picture and you might have information about yourself, but you could also put like your birthday, you can put where you work, where you've gone to school, you can say who your siblings or family members are, right? You can create this whole um, 
profile of yourself as opposed to maybe on Twitter or Instagram where people can have like next to no information if they want to, right? You can be a little anonymous gray circle um, and just a bunch of letters and numbers in your handle if you wanted to. Most of the time those are bots, but you know, if someone wanted that to be their, their Twitter persona, that's what they could do. This idea of platform specificity, specificity excuse me, is also important because people select the social media that they engage with based on the type of content that they want to see, uh, the type of content they want to produce, and the ways that they want to interact with each other. So if you think about like video-based um, platforms, right? if you want to watch people streaming video games, that's what Twitch is for. If you want to see Gen Z doing dances or you know, other funny videos, you can go to TikTok. If you want kind of almost any video under the sun, you can go to YouTube. Right? So depending on what type of content you want to engage with, you're going to pick different platforms. Um, we can also think as far as academic networks. Um, if you want to network with people, learn about research, um, post about what you're learning about at a conference, actually engage in conversation with people, academic Twitter is really good for that because that's what Twitter is set up for. If you want to mostly see like memes about what it's like to be a student or a professor, Maybe Instagram is better for that because you're not necessarily trying to engage in conversation. You could leave comments if you want, but it's more so about kind of just seeing what other people post. So again, just a couple of examples about platform specificity. Now, something that's really important when we're thinking about kind of online um, language and culture and practices is that online offline is sort of a, a, a fuzzy or amorphous boundary, right? And this is because when we participate in online spaces, we're always bringing our quote unquote offline selves into those spaces. We don't cease to be who we are in our everyday life just because we're doing something online now. And we can also look at online spaces as places where um, people come to engage with or negotiate politics, popular culture, current events, things that are happening outside of the online space. So maybe your government, wherever you are, or some politician, um, proposes a new policy or a, a law is passed or, you know, here we've had the Supreme Court making lots of um, decisions in recent weeks and people might turn to Facebook or Twitter or some other platform to engage with each other and talk about what's happening, right? So it's something from this offline space coming into this online space. We can also think about this from the, the other direction, right? Things that we do, people that we engage with in online spaces having an influence on in our offline lives. So we might pick up ways of speaking or terminology, right? People like to quote memes and vines and things they see online with their friends and kind of everyday conversation. Um, and kind of on a more serious note, we're now seeing um, how these online spaces function to shape people's ideologies. Um, so like the online radicalization of white supremacists, right? They're engaging in these online spaces and taking the things that they see and learn and acting on that in offline spaces in ways that are um, harmful, if not deadly, for people um, in their you know, lived experiences offline. So as far as, as I mentioned, this convergence of um, technology and Black cultural practices that we'll be looking at, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about these different Black cultural practices. Um, there's a lot of rich scholarly work on each of these that I'll mention, but I want to kind of forefront or give a heads up of some of the things that um, will come up or kind of be referenced. So in the US, um, there's a very rich black cultural history of oral tradition. So storytelling in different forms, um, humor is really big, and um, the use of African-American language, um, both in terms of like structural features, um, but also things like creative language play and um, other aspects that we'll see in some of the examples. Cultural expression through art. So this includes music, song and dance, visual arts like murals and painting and, and sketch, all of that. Community building and support. So the way that Black communities in the US, um, you know, prior to the internet, um, were, could create, com create community, excuse me, um, in a variety of ways and offer social support. And um, there's this idea that's been articulated about how uh, Black people in the US understand our lived experiences as um, what's the term, linked fate. So understanding that no black person is kind of an individual, but the lived conditions and experiences of any single, single black person or community um, is a reflection of kind of the, the larger experience and um, 
you know, life expectancy and, and wellness of Black people across the U.S. and around the world. Um, and also, as many people I'm sure are aware, um, a long tradition of political activism and organizing from the time of enslavement right up until today. So coming back to this idea of platform specificity, um, the way that Black people kind of bring these cultural practice into online spaces looks different on different platforms. So we can see sort of thematic um, or some sort of similarities across platforms. But it's really important to think about, again, how these affordances on different platforms allow people to do or engage in these practices in different ways. Um, and then I'll also make a note that even though I'm focused on um, kind of the US Black cultural context, many of these cultural practices are diasporic. So we'll see them um, in the communities of people of African descent around the world. All right, so next we'll take a look at um, some actual data that I've worked with um, from Vine and Tumblr. I will say, um, there's a lot of research also on Twitter. Um, I didn't include it just because of time, um, but if people have questions or are interested in that, I'm happy to talk about um, some of the great research that's been done on that during the Q&A. So first I'm gonna talk about Vine, um, heart and soul of my research. The reason I'm sure many of you are here or know about me at all. Um, so for people who um, either weren't on Vine or um, you know, kind of, Miss the boat. Uh, this is just what the Vine desktop homepage looked at at one point in time. Um, it looked different on mobile, but Vine was basically known for the short form looping video. So the, at the beginning, they could only be six seconds. Uh, things changed over time, but that's kind of what it was known for these six second looping videos. And when you go to the Vine homepage or when you went to the Vine homepage, um, you could look up videos by what were called channels. So that's what we see over here. Um, so comedy was the most popular that actually ended up getting two channels, but they also had things like video games, sports, pets, food. Um, so really based on kind of the, the topic that people were posting about or the genre. Um, as far as comedy vines, um, even though there were the two channels, even within vine comedy, there were lots of different subgenres or different types of vine comedy. Um, you know, they weren't kind of like formally delineated, but you could recognize lots of different types. Um, comedy viners often mimicked each other. Um, so there's, there was a sort of explicit mimetic culture or meme culture in vines where people would use, they'd quote the same thing or use the same special effects or music. Um, and Vine would actually like compile those where you could like click on a, a it's kind of like its own channel. You could look and see all of the Vine videos that used the same sort of meme structure. And there were also um, what were called inspired by posts where people would like explicitly reference um, or tag the posts that inspired them. And so in this way that there's this sort of like open culture of building on each other, there were these very distinct genres of Vine humor that you could recognize. And within comedy, there was a large presence of Black Viners. And so because that um, comedy was the most popular kind of Vine that was posted, there was a very prominent presence of Black Viners and kind of what they were bringing to the platform. So Vine humor, as I mentioned, has um, several different subgenres or types of humor. So one of the most popular was comedic reenactments of lived experiences, which we'll look at an example of. But people would also kind of make commentary on non-scripted moments. So they might just be filming something and then maybe talking while they're filming or add some sort of special effect to it afterwards. Um, so kind of maybe combining um, the kind of scripted and non-scripted part. There are also some that were just kind of as is in the moment recordings. Um, so there's now a sort of iconic vine of a little girl standing in front of a field of white birds. I think it's ducks. The point is that they're not chickens, but she like very proudly turns and kind of Vanna White and it's like, oh, look at all these chickens. And that's the whole video. And it's just cute and funny because she's wrong, but she's like so happy about being in front of what she thinks are a bunch of chickens. And also a big part of um, Vine humor was relatable content. And so I say hashtag relatable because at the beginning people actually included that hashtag on the video. So the point was meant to be like, this is something that someone in my audience, um, you know, can connect with and has experience with. 
I will say there was also the sort of like do it for the vine, very like extreme, absurd sort of vine humor as well, which I'm not going to get into, but again, always happy to talk about. Um, so as far as an example of this like comedic reenactments of lived experiences, just to give you all sort of a, a warm up for watching vines and also get a sense of how much they might lag if they're kind of bad. Um, so this one comes from Jerry Perp Drink, um, that's not his real name. Um, saying no matter how many chapsticks you buy. And so I'll let it play a couple times because they are short. Make sure my volume's all the way up. Tomorrow. So here you can see it's kind of an exaggerated way of representing the experience of like, you buy a bunch of chapstick, you think you're good, somehow like two days later, they've all gone missing, your lips are chapped again, and you have to start all over, right? But he's kind of exaggerating with the crying and the sad music and saying it's like one day and all, however many you know, hundred chapsticks that he bought have gone missing. So uh, certainly nothing kind of like political um, in this, but it's a, it's a recognizable type of um, genre of mind humor. Now, fine racial comedy was a specific, uh, specific subgenre of fine humor. Um, so in this section, you know, the fun thing about genres and subgenres is that there you can combine them in so many different ways. Um, so fine racial comedy was a specific genre of fine humor, um, and it's basically racial comedy that's been adapted to the affordances of the Vine platform. Racial comedy being another specific genre of humor, and I'll talk about that more in a second. But some of the features of fine racial comedy that are important is the use of cultural, racial, and linguistic stereotypes in order to construct characters with, with easily identified. This was a consequence of the second time limit, right? You're trying to convey a whole storyline in six seconds, which means you need to be very efficient in the way that you construct your characters. And that's easier to do with stereotypes or very recognizable social types. Um, people who you can look at or hear and immediately know what type of person they're supposed to be. There was also this interplay or contrast between standardized or mainstream U.S. English um, and African American English or other ethno-racial or regional varieties. Um, and so again, that, that playing into the sort of stereotype construction or being able to quickly recognize um, what type of person someone is supposed to be. So as Kelly brilliantly talked about last week, we always have uh, ideas about what type of person someone is based on the way that they speak. So beyond just saying, oh, this person sounds like maybe they're black, that then we have some sort of association based on what we think about black people. Um, facial expressions, gesture, and other forms of body movement are also really important. Um, and this goes for, you know, comedy in general, but um, I won't get into as much detail, but because of the ways, um, the types of internet discourse and genres that vines draw on things like reaction gifs and other types of videos um, there's a lot of like close-ups of people's faces and the ways that people orient their bodies to each other are really important um, like most comedy there's exaggeration like we saw um, and that comes through speech and embodiment but also things like music and other special effects and oftentimes there's additional or really important meaning conveyed through the title or the description and the uh, the video itself so for some videos, the way that you actually interpret what's presented can change drastically based on if you see it with the title or without the title or, or any of the descriptors that are in there. Now coming back to this um, genre of racial humor, um, so we have humor broadly, um, comedy is a type of humor, racial humor is a specific type of humor in that, um, but then there's also different types of racial humor. Um, if you want probably a more, more detailed and coherent way of kind of putting all this together, um, I've included my, my article that all of this draws from. So when thinking about racial humor, um, there's kind of three major types that I've engaged with. So hegemonic racial humor um, reinforces the audience's belief that the racial status quo is natural and appropriate. This is humor that draws on stereotypes of like minoritized racial groups and just presents that as the way things are, the way things that are supposed to be. It doesn't challenge them at all. The flip side of that is anti or counter hegemonic humor. Um, and this is humor that 
basically puts people or institutions with social power as the butt of the joke. So in the context of racial humor, that's going to be white people, whiteness, white supremacy, and all of the forms of like discrimination that uh, emerge from white supremacist systems. And then charged racial humor, this comes from um, Rebecca Crafting. So she sees this as a particular type of anti-hegemonic humor that not only like points out the biases and faults of people and institutions um, that have social power, but also works to like uplift and celebrate the cultures and experiences of people from minoritized groups. So even though there is, um, there are types of humor and types of comedy that aren't any of these three, but because of the nature of race, particularly in the US as being a very politicized subject, um, racial humor is pretty much always gonna fall into one of these categories. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, um, kind of trying to tie this all together. So we have anti-hegemonic racial humor, um, but then we have African-American humor as a very specific type of racial humor. Um, you know, that's in, embedded in the specific cultures and experiences of African-American people. And so if you want to learn more about this, these are some references um, that I draw on. So one of the big features is the use of African-American language, um, because one, that's the way that many African-American comedians or humorists speak and write, um, but also in the way that um, their specific like discourse practices, like ways of greeting each other or interacting with each other, and that they're very specific to African-American culture. Uh, um, this type of humor performs stereotypes in order to subvert social expectations and critically comment on the stereotypes themselves. So as opposed to hegemonic racial humor, where you're just kind of presenting the stereotype and saying like, yeah, black people act like this. Um, African-American humor says, well, this is the way you believe or the way people present black people as acting, but now we're gonna turn this on this head. Um, it constructs whites as lacking desirable qualities like self-confidence and assertiveness. So again, um, you know, taking the people with social power and making them the butt of the joke. And crucially, it grounds humor in the realities, not just of racism in the US, but specifically anti-Black racism in the US. And it does this both um, looking at kind of an institutional level, but also interpersonal. So if you've watched like Key and Peele or Chappelle show, um, those are both good examples of um, humor and comedy that get at both of these, right? They, they might talk about like policing in the US, but also talk about or have skits about like their coworkers. So getting at both of those levels of interaction. So now we're getting to the good part. So African-American humor, the specific form of racial humor, a specific form of anti-hegemonic humor. And now we're thinking about this specifically in the context of Vine racial comedy as a specific type of uh, humor online. So we'll, um, we'll look at a, a few examples here. Um, as I said, I've provided kind of basic transcripts for this first one, I've never had to transcribe zombie sounds before, so I did the best that I could. Um, but this one comes from Landon Moss. It's called Damn Zombies Too. So here, you know, we can see it's a pretty clear idea of what's happening. Um, so here, Landon Moss is getting at the idea of like, or the stereotype of black men as dangerous, um, particularly kind of through this exaggeration through the use of the zombies, but the idea being that like zombies who are supposed to be like undiscerning creatures, they just see all humans as potential like brains and food, they don't see race, um, but the stereotype of black men as dangerous is so pervasive and entrenched that even zombies are afraid of black men once he realizes that's who he was about to attack. Um, and then in the end, like the, the offense or the, the hurt at experiencing something so racist, like trumps the relief at not being eaten or attacked by a zombie. Um, so a, a couple layers of humor in that one. This next one is called The Switch. So it's by Brandon Calvillo, so the, the white guy you see on screen, and then Marlon Webb is the black guy that he's interacting with. Let's switch bodies. All right. Whoa, this is awesome. Let's switch back. Let's switch back. Let's switch bodies. All right. Whoa, this is awesome. Let's switch back. Let's switch back. 
Let's so uh, here, Brandon and Marlon are getting at the idea, well, a couple of different ideas, but um, the idea of how white people often want to embody or have some sort of proximity to blackness, but not the realities of what it means to be a black person in the US. And so in this case, they have the example of like black people, black men in particular being um, over policed and surveilled um, by police in the US. Um, and so the privilege of being able to kind of return to the safety of whiteness when he decides that he doesn't like the situation that he's in anymore. Um, so they get, getting at that idea of kind of like uh, when people say that they support black people or say that they, you know, it indicates some sort of like desire to associate with blackness, like what is the extent of that? Um, and the fact that someone's white privilege will always protect them from like truly experiencing what it's like to be black in the United States. Now this final example here, this is one that I give a very detailed um, analysis of in my article. So I'm happy to talk more about it in the Q&A. Um, I don't have uh, time to get into it now, um, but just wanna say that that's there. If people are interested in the more kind of fine grained linguistic analysis in particular. How are you two fine gentlemen doing this evening? I was wondering if you'd like to- Hey man, I should shout out not your fat ass, bro. I came out next time, you gonna give me your number, bro. How are you two fine gentlemen doing this evening? I was wondering if you'd like to- Hey man, I should shout out with not your fat ass, bro. I came out next time, you gonna give me your number, bro. How are you- So in this one here, and this is one where the title is very important for understanding how to interpret what you see. So the title, what they hear when we talk, um, they being white people and we being black people, um, it's getting at this idea of, of uh, not idea, but the, the reality and the experience of racial linguistic profiling and stereotyping. So the fact that what the two white men hear isn't the reality of what King Batch is saying, right? What they think they hear is shaped by what they expect to hear based on the fact that King Batch is a black man. So the expectation that he would speak African-American English but also the stereotype of African-American English as being the sort of um, indecipherable, it's all profanity, it's ungrammatical, like it's not an actual uh, rule-governed variety. Um, so getting at that sort of um, stereotype and experience there. So just to sort of recap, when we're thinking about um, African-American humor and how it takes shape as vine racial comedy, we're seeing this humor as a way of both representing an experience and making a sociopolitical point. Um, and we saw a couple of examples, but um, you know, there's lots of other topics that people covered in this genre. And when thinking about this as a form of resistance or as activism, vine racial comedy is uh, a good avenue for this because it's accessible to a general audience. So coming back to this idea of like the hashtag relatable vines, um, it's meant to be as accessible and relatable to as many people as possible. And we see this um, similar to other forms of humor and comedy, but it's not using big academic jargon. You don't need academic jargon to understand it. You can certainly apply academic language to it, but the idea is you can watch it. It's six seconds, so you pretty much get the point um, after one or two views. And with humor and comedy in general, oftentimes it's uh, viewed as kind of a gentler way of making critique about ideology and behavior. There's pros and cons to that, of course, but you know, oftentimes people are more willing to um, are more open to engage with thinking reflectively about the things that they're presented if it comes to this sort of comedic content as opposed to a sort of straightforward, like that was bad, that was wrong, don't do it again. All right, now moving on to Tumblr. We're gonna switch gears a bit. So Tumblr, very different platform. Um, it's a multimodal blogging platform. It's a US-based platform, so there is a US content bias, but it is international in use. Um, and one of the things that Tumblr is well known for is having this dominant sort of left-leaning sociopolitical orientation. Um, people on there have kind of reclaimed the term social justice warrior, which people kind of started using as an insult, and then people took it up as like, yeah, I'm fighting for social justice, like why would that be a bad thing? Um, there's also the flip side of people kind of being like overzealous, shaming and you know other types of discourse as well um, that people have critiqued but um, one thing that's important about tumblr is that there's prominent communities and networks of people from minoritized groups and backgrounds and so that's kind of what makes possible having these um, communities and discussions and environments where people can um, support each other and provide information and another factor of that is that tumblr well up until recently um, 
didn't really censor much of the content that was on there. And so people could have these very kind of open and explicit discussions about what was going on. Within Tumblr, I'm particularly interested in Black Tumblr, which if you're familiar with Black Twitter, it's a similar phenomenon, just on a different platform. So it's a self-referential network or multiple overlapping networks of Black Tumblr users from around the world. Um, and I say self-referential because Black people on Tumblr talk about Black Tumblr as an entity. So if something happened, you might see people on there being like, oh, Black Tumblr is going to have ideas about this, or Black Tumblr is going to come for you know, this person. And in addition to having like Black people who have blogs on Tumblr and talk about things related to their experiences, there are also what are called theme blogs. And so these would be dedicated to Black life, Black culture issues. It might be to a Black TV show or musicians, or some blogs were just dedicated to Black women. And so they'd post stories and images about Black women, and that was the only thing that they posted about. And oftentimes, um, people would use tags like Black Tumblr, Melanin, Black Girl Magic, Black Excellence, things like that. And so as far as like my process of identifying blogs and people and posts that were relevant for this research, oftentimes I would use um, search through these hashtags in addition to ways that people self-identified in their posts. Now, one of the things that I'm interested in particular on Tumblr is what I call everyday online activism. And this is something that's in no way specific to Tumblr, but when I was kind of first engaging with the idea and articulating the practices, I was focused on this in the, in the context of Tumblr and Black Tumblr in particular. So everyday online activism is adapting the practices of everyday activism, which I'll explain in a moment, to the interactional affordances um, of online context. So we can see everyday online activism on Tumblr. We can think of fine racial comedy as a form of everyday online activism. We see it on Tumblr, Instagram, lots of different platforms. Everyday activism, um, and I really like this definition from Sanja Vivian, who says, it's the sharing of personal stories and perspectives in public spaces with the aim of challenging the status quo through erosive social change. Change is an attitude that take place slowly over an extended time frame profoundly reshaping social norms as they diffuse among networked publics. So it's the idea of, again, this idea of everyday. So if you've heard the terms like everyday feminism or everyday sexism, um, it's a similar idea of like, just sort of in your day-to-day -day practices, things that you say and do, how are we um, engaging in particular types of practices? So here it's focused on talking to people in your immediate social networks or sharing um, stories and experiences about yourselves in these spaces where people can kind of engage with it. Um, maybe not more, sometimes more slowly, but maybe more meaningfully, and that helps lead them to kind of be thinking more large scale. So as far as everyday online activism within the context of Black Tumblr, um, these are some of the, the key strategies that I've identified. Um, of course, not an exhaustive list. These also overlap. Oftentimes people are doing more than one at a time. Um, but challenging hegemonic ideologies about Black people, promoting dialogue about under-discussed issues, bringing attention to hypocritical or insensitive actions or beliefs, and promoting positive representations of Black people. So just for time, I'm going to just show a couple of examples here. Um, as far as challenging hegemonic ideologies, and this example also overlaps with like pointing out uh, hypocritical actions. Um, someone was responding to a post talking about um, common names among Black people that are perceived as ghetto. And so they say, Black names do not require meanings to be respected. No one questions a white kid named Apple or Coco because it's different. But if a Black kid's name isn't conventional, it has to have meaning. Or even if it does, it's ghetto and therefore it's okay to devalue them. So pointing out this, this kind of hegemonic ideology or, or perception of Blackness as deficit and so that is kind of at the core of what makes it um, acceptable for white people to give their children basically non-conventional or non-traditional names, but then when black people do the same thing, it's somehow seen as quote unquote ghetto or bad in some way. Um, as another example of bringing attention to hypocritical or insensitive actions and beliefs, and I give it this sort of clunky wordy title because I was trying to capture a lot, um, and here, insensitive actions and beliefs includes both like explicitly, overtly racist um, actions and, and, and uh, words, but it also includes things that maybe are just ill-informed or misguided. So people aren't intentionally 
um, trying to harm another person. Maybe they just don't know um, kind of the history of what they're saying or the larger context, why you should or shouldn't use a particular word. So trying to capture all of that because um, Black Tumblr will call it all out. Um, one example here, so someone starts by saying, why when people of color, I'm talking about black folks specifically right now, tell white people that they are doing something offensive, white people go through the whole ABCs of excuses. And then they start the ABCs saying, all lives matter, but black people wear weaves, can't we all just get along? And then in a practice that's fairly common on Tumblr where someone kind of, um, maybe intentionally or unintentionally sets up something that can be riffed on or continued. Um, black people came in and finished the ABCs. They actually went all the way up through Z. Um, so they said, don't make everything about race. Everyone is human. Freedom of speech, get over it. History can't be changed. I never owned any slaves. Justice is for everyone. So the fact that black people have these phrases basically like in their back pocket, ready to go, um, is an indication that they've probably heard it more than once from more than one white person, but they went all the way up through the letter Z. Um, another aspect of this that I've looked at is specifically black feminist discourse on Tumblr. So this being discourse that's grounded in or reflective of black feminist theory and practice. I of course don't have time to kind of give a primer on black feminism. I'm happy to talk more about it in the Q and A if people are curious. But in this way, it's, it's everyday online activism that has a specific scope or framework. And, the, and I label it as Black feminist discourse, um, even though the people who are posting it don't necessarily claim it or label it as Black feminist discourse. But uh, of course, that's just kind of the way things happen. People can engage with a particular um, you know, theory or, or way of being without necessarily knowing that they're doing so. So some of the key things that I've identified in this sort of framework is the way that um, not exclusively, but primarily saying black women um, engage with this is by recognizing black women's intersecting identities and the structures of oppression that shape our experiences based on these identities. The agency that black women have to resist systems of oppression. Practices of self-definition and redefinition, particularly challenging stereotypes of black women. Um, and valuing experiential knowledge as ways of knowing and being. Um, something in addition to like institutional academic knowledge, like knowing that's not the only way of understanding the world and valuing personal narrative and sharing as ways of um, sharing that knowledge with other people. So one example here is demonstrating the ways that um, black women in this space were negotiating race, gender, sexuality, and other um, identities through critique and personal narrative. So this uh, would be an example of critique here. So they're talking about the hashtag, say his name. And they say, first off, Black Lives Matter was created by Black queer women, yet the main faces that have been recognized are men. Black women, especially trans women, get pushed to the back burner and rarely remembered after passing. When we started using hashtag, say her name, it was so Black women can be mentioned. I'm not saying that Black boys and men's lives don't matter, just don't all lives matter it. And so here they're pointing out the way that this particular hashtag, say her name, was created to challenge the erasure of Black women in discourses about um, police brutality and violence against Black people, and then how this other hashtag, say his name, was kind of uh, re-erasing women from that um, discussion. And so this post originally was posted in around 2015, I think, but this same sort of um, critique is uh, needed today as well as people are kind of re-engaging, um, you know, once again with discourses and representations of uh, police brutality and police violence against Black people. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip this one, but I'll just say that this was an example of um, a Black woman um, using personal narrative to describe how um, colorism has affected her perception of self, but also how colorism among Black men is a form of white supremacy. Um, another practice that um, was fairly common was community building and, and offering social support by validating each other's experiences and in that process oftentimes using in-group language. So in both of these examples, um, the term misogynoir is used. Um, and this is a term that was coined by Moya Bailey. It's a combination of misogyny, you know, hatred of women, and noir, the French word for black. Um, and she used it to articulate this particular brand of hatred directed at black women in American culture. Um, it's been taken up to talk more broadly about like hatred of black women around the world um, in any sort of context, but it did start in the sort of US specific context. 
Um, so the example on the left, um, again, kind of pointing out this erasure of black women, and then the example on the right um, is another person talking about colorism among black men, and then the, the person responds by saying, you know, they're the epitome of misogynoir, unfortunately. So again, just to sort of recap here, um, especially thinking in contrast to Vine racial comedy, um, Black Tumblr discourse, there's more obvious distinctions between discourse produced for a general audience, like the first few examples that we saw, um, and discourse produced for more of a kind of in-group community building type of audience, like that we saw among Black women. And because a lot of this is text-based and it's very conversational, that allows for more nuance in the kind of issues that are being discussed and also sort of dialogue. People can respond. Um, it often looks similar to like a discussion forum or a Twitter thread where people can kind of respond directly to each other. And even though I didn't show any humorous examples, um, humor is part of everyday online activism. And of course, it's going to look structurally different from buying racial comedy. Um, there might be videos, but it's not necessarily uh, it's not necessarily a video in the way that fine racial comedy is. All right, so just a few conclusions here. Um, and thinking about like what Black people are doing online, in Vi on Vine, um, on Tumblr, and Twitter, all these other online spaces, I really like, like the idea of emphatic Blackness as um, articulated by Crystal Smalls. And so she says, or describes emphatic blackness as using the largely white public space of social media to perform blackness and produce anti-racist political discourse and how that follows a long tradition of subjugated black peoples politicizing and re-racializing places and practices in pursuit of joy and liberation. So although her kind of theor theorization and discussion of this concept is focused on um, young black people on Twitter, we see uh, this is still applicable to the examples that we've seen. And unapologetically centering Blackness, Black language, Black perspectives and experiences can be read as refusals of the performances of respectability demanded by white supremacy vis-a-vis -vis white normativity. So basically people, um, Black people taking up space in these online places and refusing to kind of conform to white cultural ideas of uh, propriety or what's appropriate in those spaces is a way of, th that's this emphaticness, that's the emphatic of emphatic Blackness. Something that's important to remember, though, as we're thinking about um, kind of Black discourse online, Black cultural practices, we've looked at examples that were, um, you know, political in nature, but it doesn't have to be political in order for it to be a form of resistance. Um, Solo and Steele have a great article where they, are, they articulate this idea of like Black joy as resistance, and they talk about how joyful social media posts um, celebrate Black life in ways that challenge mainstream media's attempts to fix Black people and Black life into a position of death and despair. They assert Black people as fully human, capable of experiencing and expressing a full dynamic range of emotion, and capture, share, and circulate expressions of Black life without concern for the white gaze. And so this is really important because, um, yeah, well, I'll talk more about this in a minute, but especially in the moment like right now where so much of what we're seeing is images or descriptions of black people dying or having violence inflicted upon them. Um, it's important to remember and see black people as like fully human people who experience a range of, uh, excuse me, experience a range of things. Um, and just to come back to another vine, um, thinking about this idea of black humor and joy. So while the person who almost dropped their croissant probably wouldn't describe this as a moment of joy, um, I mean, this is another like iconic vine, but it's really just, it's black people just living their life. They're just being goofy. They're in their house. So one of them's eating something. The other one decides to kind of play a prank. Um, you know, the thing that always gets me about this video, besides how invested in the croissant the first person is, is just the, the laughter of the person behind the camera. Um, they're just enjoying the moment so much. And so this is what Lou and Steele are getting at when they talk about, you know, humor and joy as, you know, showing the full range of Black emotion and experiences, just showing us being people. So if we kind of expand out, um, thinking about 
you know, black political discourse, humor, joyous activism, this emphatic blackness. We can kind of think about just the basic black presence online as a form of resistance and activism in that way. Um, as we've seen, the, black, the presence of black people online creates the opportunity to center the spectrum of black experiences. And again, this is that practice of, of humanizing black people, being able to see us as more than people who are victims of police br brutality or other forms of violence. Um, and when we're trying to get people to put in the work to change structures to benefit black people or to uplift black people, um, that's a lot easier to do if non-black people view black people as fully human. Also, the presence of black people online ensures that black people are seen and heard. So a way of resisting the erasure of black experiences that often happens in mainstream media or the erasure of context or other details or other perspectives that often happens. The presence of black people online also holds non-black and black people accountable for their actions. Um, in one sense, oftentimes people know if they have a particular audience or that the people that they're talking about are kind of there, they might be more conscious about what they say in the first place. Um, but also as, we, as we've seen, black people will hold um, other people accountable for the things that they say and do. So we saw black women holding black men accountable for the things that they do, black people holding white people accountable for the things that they do. Um, so again, just that, that sort of calling out of practices that are harmful in various ways. Um, so just to conclude, if we come back to this idea of like what counts as activism that I proposed at the beginning, um, resistance of hegemonic power, ideologies and practice, and efforts toward equity and justice through both interpersonal and institutional change. Um, from that perspective, um, all of what we've seen so far on, on Vine, on Tumblr, and on other platforms as well, um, definitely count as activism from my perspective. And I'll end with a, one of my favorite tweets from Clint Smith saying, we tried to tell y'all an ancient African-American proverb. That was wonderful, Kenda, thank you very much. Um, so yes, if you have a question, then please um, either raise your hand, that would be, I don't know, it's nice. Um, I think to raise your hand and actually talk um, but if you don't want to do that that's fine you can type it into the chat box and I will call on you as um, as they appear um, I'll let people think of their questions um, just for a, a moment <laughs> thank you very much for coming people that have to go um, yeah I'm aware that some people it's different times of day for people it's dinner time or you have a meeting or whatever so yeah thanks for coming and um the whole question and answer session will be recorded as well um so and i'm happy people, to if people want to like send an email I, I know i went over time but if people have questions you know you can email me tweet at me whatever i'm happy to engage yeah take the conversation to twitter it's always always nice <laughs> to carry it on afterwards um while people are um think oh um i see Somebody, no, in the chat. Do you want to ask your question in real life? If so, unmute yourself and do so. Hi, good morning. Good morning or good afternoon or whatever time it is. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so uh, I'm researching um, other in and uh, the use of stand-up comedy as well in my research. And um, um, just wondering about the... Um, let me just uh, have a look on my notes. Um, the genres of racial humor, you've mentioned uh, hegemonic racial humor and anti-hegemonic racial humor and then the charged racial humor. I was just wondering, was there um, a type in all these um, genres that you have mentioned that does, um, in a sense, all of what you've mentioned in every like sep but separate ones what i mean is that because i i did some stand up uh as well before in i would describe it as somehow that is that that cannot be that i can't really find a place for it in the tribes the types that you've mentioned sorry and i'm really confused to be honest about how or where it falls on because sometimes I would do um, 
I'll do the other end or I'll be the racist one. And sometimes I'll be encountering that discourse of racism in a sense. Um, does that, does my question make sense? Yeah. So, um, with the types of comedy and, and with kind of genre in general, is there, they're not sort of hard and fast lines between them. And particularly with stand-up comedy, um, any given bit or chunk of that could encompass a lot of these different um, types, right? And sometimes the, the, the thing that makes something funny is it starts out seeming like it's gonna be sort of hegemonic humor, like they're building up to these stereotypes and then maybe at the end, they kind of flip it on its head or say something unexpected. So um, with stand-up comedy, particularly because that sort of, um, that creativity and the, the element of surprise and those types of things are, are a big part of that as well. Um, people definitely play and, and move in between these different genres. Um, and again, those three aren't the only, the only three genres of, of humor and comedy more generally. So uh, Rebecca Crafting in her book also, also talks about like shock humor, safe humor, or like character-based humor, which maybe would engage with race, but it might not be the focus. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different ways that that people might be coming at this. And so um, in the article where I talk about the, the vine racial comedy, I kind of get into more detail about how like trying to categorize it sometimes can be messy. So you you might want to just focus on like one particular bit and mm -hmm. how that fits in or, or compares to these different um, categories of humor. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. That was yeah. it to be honest for me. Thank you. <laughs> there are two questions in the chat um so first of all lauren ackerman who um has had to go I, I don't know if she has already but um she asked about the linked fake phenomenon in black americans experience and if that's something that occurs in other diaspora or in black diaspora in other places is that something that you would know about um i mean i can't speak to to diasporic kind of perspectives um but the idea basically being that like because black people who were brought to the US um, during enslavement, I mean, they were essentially forced to become, um, you know, non-biological family. They were the only people looking out for each other. So this idea of like, um, you know, looking out for everyone around you, whether you know them or don't know them, um, whether they're biologically related to you or not. Um, and then as people kind of you know, moved once the slavery ended and people were able to kind of move to different parts of the country. Um, and then the way that anti-blackness was instituted structurally, you know, there was still the same need to kind of protect and support people, uh, black people around you, whether or not you knew them or not. Um, because if you, if you work to change the structure for yourself or for one other person, you're still changing that for the larger community. So that idea of like recognizing that the, the things that are causing the experience of one black person are things that are, all, are also inflicting um, you and everyone else in some way. Um, so that's a, the kind of basic sense of like linked fate is like, um, uh, you can also think of it like whether or not um, something direct, directly affects me as a black person, like individually, it doesn't mean it's not affecting maybe like my family members who live in a different part of the country or, you know, a generation that comes after me. So just having kind of a broader perspective of like how all of that comes together. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question in the chat from Avery, um, who says amazing informative talk, echoing lots of other sentiments in the chat. Um, <laughs> So Avery says, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the effect of white people co-opting some of these practices, i.e. digital blackface in using reaction GIFs. Not sure if this is something your research is focused on at all, but I'm curious to hear your perspective on how this might undermine activist efforts or create other new opportunities for activism specific to new social media platforms. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I always give kind of the caveat of like, there are a lot of amazing things about social media and also it can be a dumpster fire, right? Like depending on what part you're looking at, depending on what day it is, <laughs> depending on who's in your network, like you know, it can always look really different. Um, and so, yeah, on the one side, uh, or on the one hand, like having reaction gifts of black people is a way for, you know, in these digital spaces, black people can kind of like embody their responses. Um, it might be like a particular, facial expression, it might be, you know, a clip from a TV show that uses sort of like a black cultural, you know, phrase, common phrase there. But then, yeah, it sort of becomes 
public domain in some ways, especially if you're using something like Giphy or like the GIF keyboards where they're just in there. Um, and so there's no sort of like rules or regulations saying that like, oh, non-Black people can't use Black GIFs. But I think, I, I, I don't remember the author's name of the, the article about digital blackface, but kind of they make the point of like, there are so many like gifts or memes or whatever of white people that you could use you know if you're a white person like think critically about why are you choosing to use this black person instead is it because you think they uh, are over exaggerated you think it's funny in some way if you think it's funny is it because the like what's being said is funny or you know the context of the show it comes from so having that sort of context um can be important but yeah i think that's one of those where and this is not restricted to online context in any way where like black people kind of create something or try to carve out some sort of space for themselves and then non-black people particularly white people are like well why do you get to have that we want that too we want to be part of it and so sort of co-opting that and then usually black people find another way of either they kind of drop that and move on to something new or kind of give pushback or in some way um, try to reclaim what they tried to create for themselves in the first place but yeah it's an ongoing process it's always messy and that's why kind of creativity is a big part of this in a broader sense yeah thank you um sorry i had the participants panel scrolled all the way to the bottom and all the raised hands are at the top so i'm really sorry <laughs> i've asked all the questions really out of order apologies for everyone with their hands up patiently um dominique canning do you want to ask your question next yes hello um Hi. this is a really cool talk um i was on Twitter saying that I hadn't actually heard your research or like even about you until last week. So I'm very happy that I got to see this. Um, and also that your point on black joy as just like resistance on its own was like very, very cool. Um, because part of what I want to do with my research, I promise there's a question, uh, is look at different types of resistance um, within language um, and just like existence. Um, but my question is um has to do specifically with tumblr um and just based on like my past experiences with tumblr but also a line of research i did in undergrad where you sometimes see some sorts of within the marginalized you're not enough of this to be able to like say this thing or make this joke and is this something you encountered when um you were looking at your examples and i guess how frequent was it if you did yeah um it was definitely something that i saw um just being someone who you know was on tumblr not as much in um excuse me <coughs> not as much in the data that i was looking at since i was more interested in sort of the I guess from the activist perspective is more about kind of like how do we point out things that uplift black people how do we point out things that are broadly harmful to black people so it was less about um you know people saying like mm, i don't know if you're black enough to like make this claim that x is harmful to black people um usually it, it might be more so of like i don't know who you are that's saying this but yes i agree like this particular practice is harmful to black people um but i think that sort of policing um for sure it definitely happens i mean there's i saw lots of people talking about sort of the and trying to call out sort of like the biracial aesthetic as people talked about it like as a way of pointing out like colorism in media you know how they were like oh well it's always like the light-skinned women with light hair and curly hair or light eyes and curly hair that people you know seem to engage with but then at the same time you know black women would come in and be like okay i fit the biracial aesthetic but like and i don't you know, they're trying to say, like, it feels undermining to me to be able to, for you to be calling me, like, not black enough, or like, I'm the only type of black woman that people respect, and like, that's not my experience. And so, yeah, that's sort of always trying to negotiate who gets to be part of this conversation. And, and I forget the term I used before, I think I said, like, overzealous. <laughs> that's sort of like Tumblr, like, you know, I know everything about this, even though I've read like two articles and that's it. And now I think I'm an expert and I'm going to tell you what you can and can't do. Um, so I tried to not ignore it, but it wasn't sort of, um, yeah, it wasn't crucial to kind of the, the, the broader phenomenon that I was interested in as far as this like everyday activism kind of discourse. But I think that's really important research if that's something that you're, you're interested in or pursuing, because I think that, yeah, it's, it's something that's kind of quietly talked about, but like not publicly as far as like 
even like community internally, like black people, black people policing each other and kind of what are the, the effects of that as far as like, yeah, everything. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Dominique. Um, Eleni, you're next. Right, yeah. Uh, hi, and thank you so much for this talk. It, it was really great, really fascinating intersection of disciplines as well. Um, so, yeah, my, I didn't know anything about vines, so I'm learning about vines, I know about memes, uh, but I have a question that concerns both. So, I know memes, how memes work, um, they, they have this kind of intertextuality in the sense that they all follow uh, the memes that belong to the same kind of template, uh, a lot of the time also belong to the same kind of discourse. So you get uh, a lot of memes of the same sort reproducing hegemonic discourse, for example. And I assume the same happens with vines. So you have genres of vines that you recognize this is this type of, this, this template of vine. So uh, do you have in your data cases where uh, black vine, black tumbler uh, have reclaimed uh, previously recognized as hegemonic or racist uh, memes or vines? That's a very good question. Um, I'm trying to think. So vine is an interesting context because so many of the memes that started in the first place originated from black viners, which isn't to say that they weren't hegemonic in some way. Um, but it was more of like in-group humor. Um, so it became more sort of problematic when like black people are making jokes about black people and then non-black people came in and were like, oh, I'm gonna make the same joke. <laughs> um, so hmm, I'm trying to think of more specific examples. Um, so at the, uh, for anyone who's maybe familiar with Vine or people who weren't, um, when Vine first emerged, I mean, there's lots of great iconic classic Vines. There are also some like awful cringy ones as well. So at the very beginning, there was this sort of genre of like white people versus black people Vines. So they'd take the same action and then they'd say, this is how white people do it and this is how black people do it. But it was always the same person doing both. So it might be a white person being like, this is how white people act in scary movies and this is how black people act in scary movies. And so a lot of it had to do with like these performances of like mock African-American English that were really like, I don't know why they thought it was okay to do that. Um, so I think like those early days, those sorts of ones would be the best examples. I don't have any um, in my data that I've looked at specifically, but I do remember those being around. Um, and I think just broadly with memes, um, a lot of times people don't know where they originated from. Like they're, they're just like, oh, this is a meme now, I'm gonna use it. And like, they don't have the context for sort of like, maybe what some of the words mean or particular structures like the, I was just in a Twitter conversation about this the other day, but the sort of like X be like memes, like academics be like, and then they give an example, like that construction, that, that habitual be, is like a feature of African American English, but now it's become sort of decontextualized and people are just like, oh, it's an internet meme. So that, you know, isn't like hegemonic racial humor or anything, but it's just an example of kind of how these particular mimetic forms can be taken up um, by people who don't understand the context or don't recognize the context of like where they emerged from. Thank you. Um, Great, thanks. Christina. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. That was super, super interesting. Um, I have a kind of personal question and I just would love to get your, your individual like thoughts on this. So as an, um, as an Asian American, I'm like obviously neither black nor white. And I have found myself in recent days like often kind of struggling to on the one hand, so, so, so obviously I am in this weird intermediate situation where I have experienced both the, you know, some of the privileges of being white and also some of the um, discrimination of being not white. And um, 
my impression, so I'm not on, on Vine or Tumblr, but um, so my impression from Twitter, from like black Twitter say, um, is that, and a lot of your examples are like this, feel like this. Um, my impression has been like, it is instructive um, and really informative for me to just observe and understand what's going on there. So including all these like, just expressions of black joy as activism and, and you know, stuff like that. Like I, um, so I, I feel like I meant to observe that and understand it and clock it, but it's not my space to participate, right? So it's not for me to jump in and be like, oh yeah, I know you mean totally, you know, like I, I, that's definitely not for me to say. So it kind of feels like, um, from an outsider perspective, like that is meant to be a kind of a safe space for black people on Twitter, right? But the, the, the reason I kind of think about this is like sometimes I don't totally know um, what the, the most helpful and least harmful um, way for me to be is with, for example, like my black students, like is it more helpful for me to say, um, to try to identify with them, or is it more helpful for or for me to say like I have no idea what it's like to be you, and um, or is I mean probably there's no right answer, but I would just love to hear your your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's a both like an individual and a context specific sort of question. We actually just had a discussion about this in the context of teaching um, in my own department as far as like, um, you know, there being very few black students in our, you know, in, in Santa Barbara at UCSB um, in linguistics in particular. And so since we, uh, the majority, literally everyone except one um, of our faculty are not black, you know, how do we sort of ensure that we're being inclusive of, of black students in, our, in these spaces? Um, and I think, I mean, there's a balance between wanting to, you know, ensure that black students feel included and, and that their, you know, experiences are represented and not wanting to sort of single them out, um, as saying like, oh, I recognize that you as a black person are like minoritized in this space, like, um, and so I think part of that can be, um, you know, pedagogical as far as like, you know, I, I, I don't know as far as like what you teach or, or what those classrooms look like, but thinking about like ways of representing um, black experiences or including, you know, black language and culture and, and what you're teaching. And so I always take the approach of like, if I'm teaching about something that is not my own experience, um, being the messenger, like not trying to replicate or speak on behalf of, but saying like, here is, you know, research by someone from this community. Here is an article, here's a podcast, here is, you know, a tweet, right? Like you can say, here is someone talking about their experiences in their own words um, and saying like, I can't speak to this. This is not me. I, I can't say one way or another, but this is something that someone has shared publicly. And so I'm going to, you know, share that with you. Um, so that's kind of one approach that I take as far as teaching. Um, and I think it's like on an interpersonal level, it, it really, it, yeah, it depends on kind of, you know, some black students in the class might be like, I just want to blend in. Like one way that I can feel included is to not be singled out or pointed out as like the one black student who's in this class right now. Um, and so, yeah, I think sort of that's a learning as you go, like getting to know your students better. Um, you know, I've kind of been on both sides where I've had te teachers kind of say like, okay, I'm acknowledging the fact that you're the only black person in this space and we're going to be talking about X issue. Like, would you prefer that I, you know, do you want to speak on this? Do you, would you prefer not to me not to call on you? You know, and say so they, they were kind of proactive about it. And in that case, it was it was a good way to approach it. And in other cases, I'm like, I don't, I don't need to be like a special voice on anything in this context. Um, yeah, so I guess that's the best I can say is like it, it, it depends and it's context specific. But um, you know, well, we all I think trying. <laughs> As, you know, like, you know, asking this sort of question, being cognizant of the fact that this is something that people need to think about proactively, I think is kind of the first step. And then, you know, we can always try. And if something doesn't work, we can 
think about why it didn't work and revisit and try and try and do better the next time. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, Joseph, would you like to ask your question next? Uh, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so first of all, thank you very much. And I'd just like to apologise. I'm really sorry, but I did miss the start of the talk. Um, just got a bit sort of involved in my work and I completely missed the start. So I'll, I'll definitely be watching that in the recording. But thank you very much for the talk. Um, I think in particular, um, sort of my question is around the, the part where you sort of mentioned about how names um, uh, are particularly sort of suggest it to be you know ghetto if it's sort of a um if it's an uh, a black name it, it's sort of like a race name based on uh anglican names which are often perceived as like quirky or something like that um mm. and sort of so i'm currently uh, an a-level student so sort of for me the main thing i'm trying to sort of understand is how i could sort of apply this in other areas so i was just wondering sort of whether you felt this is more sort of um sort of if it's a, a class-based issue which is sort of due to a lot of systematic racism sort of uh, black communities are sadly left in these areas of uh, lower income areas or um, a, a lower class which sort of those are the people that are being uh, criticized for the names whereas middle class people and the upper class people who tend to be uh, from white backgrounds are sort of oppressing them for the same things that they're doing and they're sort of you know criticism that's very uh hypocritical or whether you would rather say this is something uh sort of more based on the fact that these are names that are not um anglicized i suppose the word there was that case where that professor was asking their student to anglicize their name recently because it he felt it sounded a certain way which obviously it didn't even sound that way it was just he was reading it in an anglican sort of format which was you know, he didn't even bother learning the proper pronunciation, but sort of which, so the question is, yes, yeah, so what do you feel is the biggest reason behind that, that main issue? Um, I think it's certainly a combination. Um, I think the, the bringing up class is a good point. Um, so thinking about like uh, black celebrities who maybe have kids with, you know, unconventional names like Beyonce and Jay-Z's first child blue ivy like we hear it so much that now we're just like oh yeah blue ivy beyonce and jay-z's kid like you don't really think about the fact that the the, the child's first name is a color like blue yeah. um and so maybe i at this point i don't even remember like maybe when they first announced her name people were like oh blue ivy what um but now it's really commonplace like people don't really comment on it so i think the class issue is important as well um but then it speaks to the fact that like only black people who have reached a certain social status through other means kind of have the freedom to engage in this like non-traditional um, quote unquote non-traditional naming of their children um, in a way that non-black people have more freedom to do regardless of class. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think I saw someone say something like Cardi B's daughter culture, you know, spelled with a K. And so I think because yeah, I think the idea of like celebrity is a good way to kind of think about how these sort of factors intersect because um, yeah, there, there will always be people who have critiques of it and it's not about the, um, it becomes less about the name itself obviously and it's about who, whose child it is yes, or kind of yeah. the race or the identity of the child. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really good point that it's not just about race, but I think also like, we can see this in other contexts too about like um, as far as like anglicizing names the way that um, and this is not my area of research other people have have done this but thinking about um, when students particularly like Chinese or other East Asian students like study in the US and they choose to take on an English name mm -hmm. and if the professors like some professors might push back and be like no 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 like you need to use your given name yeah and students saying no I'd rather people use my English name instead of like mispronouncing my given name for four years. Like, like so the agency of like being able to choose how you want people to um, engage with your name and that, that as a reflection of like your culture and identity. And so, I mean, that's kind of a, a, a tangential issue, but um, yeah, I think there's a lot of, there's always multiple factors at play 
um, and naming as being something that's so, so personal, um, I think is yes. another important aspect of that as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for your question, Joseph. Um, so we've got two more questions uh, with their hands up and then one more in the chat. And um, that should probably take us up to the end of our time, I think. So Mary Caitlin, do you want to ask your question next? Yeah. Hey, Kendra, thank you for a brilliant talk. This was so, um, so great. I, I love your JLA paper and it was really exciting to see another um, component of that. Um, so I've got another Tumblr question. Mm -hmm. um, my, my dissertation research looks at Argentine fans of English language media and popular culture. And as you know, fandom is a big component of what people do on Tumblr. Um, so my, my question is, um, I, I think you mentioned that um, your work is really focused on people in the US. So my question is maybe just stuff you saw out of the corner of your eye, or maybe you have intuitions on. I, I, I suspect you probably don't have it in your data directly, but um, with the Argentine fans I work with on Tumblr, um, their kind of activism, social justice warrior component of their Twitter presence was really oriented. It was really US focused. Um, mm -hmm. So um, there was really little, I mean, once in a while they'd make a post about the political situation in Argentina or something going on in Latin America more broadly, but um, really a lot of their political engagement on that platform was U.S. focused, even though they weren't in the U.S., many of them had never been there. But I think, obviously, because of the kind of American-oriented nature of the platform, um, that was that was the mainstream of the political discussion. So, I was wondering if you noticed whether people on Black Tumblr from outside the U.S. were targeting their. Sorry for the siren noise going by. Whether, um, whether people on Black Tumblr from outside the US were using Tumblr to target their online activism towards racial or political issues in the US. Um, sorry, apologies for that noise. Um, or whether you see that kind of US focus of, um, of Tumblr as a really strong characteristic of that platform. And I'll turn off my sound so you can answer the question in peace. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think it, a combination, um, I think in discussions about kind of like anti-blackness, um, anti-black racism as sort of broad or like global phenomenon, um, there was less sort of distinction. I think because, so again, this idea of sort of like offline and online convergence, like so much of the events and things that people were kind of orienting to, like things that were covered in mainstream media and stuff, that having a US bias. So then like that is reflected in the way people are kind of engaging in these discussions online. But there was also, um, as part of Black Tumblr, there was also frequently discussions about like, there are black people outside of the US and we need to talk about them, right? So talking about, you know, how people experience, experience anti-black racism in the US is not the same as what happens in Britain or Australia or even Canada, like um, other places in Europe, Latin America, right? Like needing to understand that when you say, oh, black people experience things in this way, like you can't just assume that that's the same way for everyone. So there were definitely those conversations of saying like, we need to add nuance to this conversation. Um, but I think broadly it was, uh, there was a definitely like a US bias to the way that people were, um, Kind of engaging in these conversations. Thank you. Yeah, that echoes a lot of um, observations in my work. So thank you, and thanks again yeah, for the talk. Thank you. Okay, uh, Razika, sorry to keep you waiting so long, but um, go ahead and ask your question. Good afternoon, everyone. No worries. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, my point is um, an elaboration of what Dominic has pointed out earlier, um, because it's partially linked to it. Uh, going back to the idea of black joy, um, have you noticed other things about about this, like apart from black joy? Like, were there any other forms of uh, resistance and um, uh, activism um, from black people, um, according to what you have analysed and noticed so far, and on what basis you you've just like chosen? Um, 
on the other side. Um, so you froze a little bit at the end, but uh, I think you're asking like, kind of what was the motivation yeah. for choosing like the, joy yes. and humor? Yes. Um, yeah. So to answer the last part of the question, um, I've just always really loved like humor and comedy. Um, I love watching like stand up comedy and, and you know, reading humor and things like that. And then, you know, I also like being on social media. And so I have just always loved the way that um, uh, people on the internet, but black people in particular are so creative and humorous um, with what they produce online, excuse me. Um, and so that sort of became the avenue that I was like, oh, people are being really creative, but like in different ways on these different platforms. Like what I see people doing on Twitter is different from Tumblr, is different from Instagram, is different from Vine. And so um, that's why I chose to kind of go like on each platform, seeing like how are people doing things slightly differently. Um, and I was just kind of originally coming from the, the perspective of like humor. Um, and so, um, I will say so in the Lewin Steele article that I cited, humor and joy are not, they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, so people can be humorous and be expressing a joy in that way, but um, joy can also be, you know, kids playing, doing double touch, you know, outside of the yard. And, and a lot of yes. the vines that people posted was like black kids just playing and singing and, um, you know, just being goofy kids and so it doesn't necessarily have to be like a humorous aspect to it um to 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 evoke joy in that way um so i think there are definitely other other ways of being like activist or like activist oriented um so particularly on on, on tumblr um so like the examples that i showed that were not necessarily humorous um but yeah, I mean, people will use sarcasm, which you know, I guess kind of can fall into the realm of. Yeah, humor. excuse me. My yeah. question really was, um, on what basis you considered this as resistance and not a normal way of living? Why black joy is resistance and not a normal way of living like other people in the, the rest of the world? So why why is why is joy specifically resistance as opposed to just like mm -hmm. existing as resistance? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, misunderstood the question. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. Yeah, so, so I, I think, um, and again, like, uh, the, uh, you know, Smalls and the Lewin Steel article articulate this really well, but because Black people are positioned, Black people specifically in the U.S. context are positioned so frequently as, as victims um, of police violence, of anti-Black racism, of poverty, which is real, but it's not the only thing that Black people experience, right? So the way that Black existence kind of baseline is presented in the U.S. context is this sort of like negative deficit sort of framing. And so to resist, basically it's like a polarization, right? Like if we're kind of starting out at such a, like a lower point, like instead of just saying like, no, we can resist without these things, which is true, but also saying like Black people we can be the other end of that, right? We, we can be joyous, we can be happy, we can be goofy, um, you know, just joke around with each other. So from my perspective is this like having to sort of start from a, a, a farther end um, or like a, I don't wanna say lower, but it's a different starting point um, to kind of have to say like, okay, now let's go to the other end and say people can do all of these like positive things and then maybe we can eventually like meet in the middle and say like, look, we can just exist um, in this world. It doesn't have to be, super positive, super negative, we can have this full range of like human experience and emotion. Um, yeah. does, that, does that answer your question? Definitely, yes. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, okay, so I just, I want to ask one final question that's in the chat. Um, unless Erin, if you want to ask your question with your voice, then please feel free to unmute yourself and do so. But otherwise, I'm just going to read it out for you. Um, and so, yeah, um, Erin says, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Although I have heard of Vine and experienced it for a few years. Since I'm 16, TikTok has become the new Vine. There are multiple issues with the algorithms of TikTok in regards to the promoting of um, people of color, people of color's accounts. I was just wondering if you had any research on newer social medias, including Snapchat, Instagram, and more. If not, I was wondering if you could comment on it. Thanks so much again for the extremely informative talk. Sorry, I stumbled over that because it said POC and I didn't know how to read that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I forgot to give my, my Q and A disclaimer, which is like, 
no, I haven't done research on TikTok yet. Yes, I plan to. Um, yeah, so I have heard of, of, you know, been reading about kind of the algorithms and, and how um, the content of like um, black content creators and other, other creators of color kind of getting buried in there. Um, and how that has to do with like, I don't know if it's like the, the facial recognition technology or what gets you, but basically I was saying, saying like, my For You page is just white people and I don't know <laughs> why this is. Um, there is definitely research on Instagram and um, Snapchat is harder. Um, so things like Snapchat and WhatsApp where it's more private, um, that research has to be done. Basically you have to get people to kind of agree to have a researcher look at their like private messaging between friends. So it's like the, the, the process of gathering that data is different as opposed to something that's public. Um, like Vine or, or, or TikTok or things like that. Um, I guess this is a good place for me to plug the Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies. Um, so it's a center based out of NYU in the US, but um, it's people researching the intersections of race, technology, and media from like all kinds of disciplinary perspectives. And there's a lot of amazing work going on. Um, and so, um, you know, journal articles, books, all of that stuff is listed on that website. And so um, I'm drawing blanks on names now, but um, yes, I, I have, there is research out about um, those various platforms, whether or not they are focused on um, issues of race is different. You know, some people have looked at it more from just like a broader like communication theory perspective or maybe interactional linguistic perspectives. Um, so depending on kind of uh, what type of of research you're looking for that might look a little bit different, but um, it's definitely out there. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for your question as well. That was a really good question. Okay, um, I'm going to say it's just after eight th uh, six thirty now, so I'm going to say that that's um, all we've got time for um, today. So, um, Kendra, um, thank you once again. That was just um, a fantastic talk. And yeah, I'd just like to echo, there's a million compliments in the chat and all the snaps and just everybody has loved this. So um, yeah, thank you very, very much for, for doing the talk. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, thanks to my colleague, Philippa, who I think has already had to go, but um, has um, been the one who's emailing you the links and so on. Um, this has been a really nice series of talks. So thanks everyone for coming and making it so interesting with all your good questions and um yeah stay in touch we'll um hopefully organize uh, more of these in the near future and we'll let you know about them but otherwise bye for now thank you very much oh uh, one more thing ruby in the chat says could you share your twitter handle i'll um, pop that in the chat as well is it underscore or do you want to do it yeah yeah, yeah pop your twitter handle in the chat Sylvia, um, we haven't got one lined up for next week. Um, we've got into summer now for us, and so um, we've kind of, yeah, come to the end of our series. Um, but if there are more people that want to do talks, then um, get in touch with us. I feel like maybe I froze there. I said um, there isn't a talk lined up for next week, um, but um, we are happy to kind of carry on organising them for as long as our money lasts, which isn't much longer, actually. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Um, we will hopefully um, start up again in the new year, um, the new academic year, which for us starts again in late September-ish. Okay, all right, once again, thank you very much, Kendra. Thank you again for coming, everybody else, and see you all again soon. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for your great questions. <laughs>